Hey guys, we are back in studio with Ali Talks Tech. Today I have Andy Halsall with me, co-founder, CEO of Power Internet. So as is usual with my conversations, I always want a little bit of personal. Talk, Andy, talk about who you are, family, why Kenya, but if you are Kenyan, first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation, please feel free to talk about that. Why Kenya? What's poor internet? And then we'll let it flow from there. Andy, over to you. Great. Thanks, Ali. It's great to be here. Um, so my background, I was born in the, the north of the UK in a, a small uh, village on the coast. Um, and Like Mombasa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this, you can see the sea. That's, yes. that's about the okay. similarity to Mombasa, okay. um, but uh, good fish as well. So maybe some similarities. Um, and I, um, I kind of grew up in this in this small village and uh, kind of got hooked on on tech at an early age. Um, as we sort of got into uh, PCs, were starting to become a thing back in back when I was a youngster. Um, How and long ago was that? I was born in 1973, so wow, okay. I'm, I'm just about to hit the big 50, okay. or getting, heading towards the 50. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, home computers were becoming a thing. Um, um, you know, our school got a, a computer, which we all shared and played around with. And uh, bit by bit, I kind of moved from playing games to wondering how you write the games. Um, and one thing led to another, and, you know, I got hooked on playing with computers and programming them and you know that sort of became the starting point for my my career um you know went to went to kind of university mm -hmm. and studied computing mm -hmm. um and then um played to one of my other loves which was travel okay and so when i when i left university um i took a job which was for me was perfect because they basically told me you would have to travel they had no business in the uk uh -huh. so it was like oh fantastic i can mm -hmm. i can go elsewhere and so i spent um a few years living in places like spain and portugal and nice. other countries around around europe and so I got the the kind of the travel bug and also met my wife on those those travels and so a long paid holiday basically basically yeah exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> how lucky are you <laughs> <laughs> exactly it was a great job right you know so yeah so basically as you say a paid holiday uh traveling around europe seeing all of these countries getting to to live in these places um and this was at the time when mobile phones were first mm -hmm. starting to appear um so i got sort of hooked from computing into telecoms mm -hmm. um you know when these were sort of the times when you know people were thinking maybe a few thousand people would be using mobile phones mm -hmm. and suddenly i got involved millions In incredibly millions and and that's where it sudden you know i guess what was started off as a sort of tech nerdery that i you know kind originally started with started realizing wow this stuff is 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 big you know we're going to see a lot of people using this stuff and, and what are the implications of that so um started moving away from um from being a pure techie into looking at kind of what's the what's going to be the impact of having all this technology so and it became mainstream basically yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Well, what yeah. period of time was this? This would be kind of 93, 94, mm -hmm. 95. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, you know, most people didn't have a, a phone back then. Uh, certainly in Europe, there was, nobody had mobile phones. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we went to, I went to Spain to help um, start what eventually became Vodafone Spain. Nice. And there was like 20 of us, and we thought we'd have maybe you know, a few thousand customers and we signed up a million customers in, in three months and wow. everything, you know, and of course the, the, the tech side of things kind of exploded because we designed everything for a few thousand customers and suddenly so got millions. That yes. must have been quite a strain on the, on the tech platform. How did you, how did you scale that? I mean, from expecting probably 10, 20,000, you get a million. <laughs> and, and everything had been, done not on the cheap but done to, for that level of customers so um you know there's there's this there was a sort of moment where we realized we had to kind of up our game because mm -hmm. suddenly the network goes mm -hmm. down 
overnight. Yeah, and nobody could find out what was going on. And it turned out that one of the servers, which was under somebody's desk, had been unplugged by a cleaning lady. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> eventually, fa- eventually found a place to plug this thing back in, and suddenly the networks bring us to life. And so suddenly, uh, you know, the CEO is signing off on a new data center because you know yes. that sort of stuff cannot happen again, wow. right? So, wow. Wow. Um, you know, when you expect to have a small business and suddenly it becomes mm. massive, massive, yeah. Um, yeah, then everything has to change, and everyone's left scrambling around. We built all the IT systems mm. designing mm. for for small numbers of customers, and suddenly wow. you're going. You know, how do we deal with millions of customers? So it was a, a real so IT shock. operations became critical. Yeah, to, and to the, the speed of the growth, and suddenly we're yes. hundreds of people, mm. and the you know we're building data centers, and mm. we're um, you know sort of shipping in equipment and people from all over the world to kind of hold this thing together. So it was you know it was a fascinating wow. kind of experience wow. to go through that sort wow. of just insane growth. Um, Amazing, great. So from Europe. To Kenya, yeah, via the Middle East, but via the Middle East, <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. uh, but um, yeah, uh, you know, I sort of spent my time in and around the telecom industry, either mm-hmm. building telecom businesses or investing in them, mm-hmm. um, and I ended up working for this um, this telecom business based out of out, out again out of Spain, actually mm-hmm. called called Fon, and we were building millions of Wi-Fi hotspots. Fon. Fon. Mm, F-O-N, okay. Yeah. Fun, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were building millions of Wi-Fi hotspots with uh, big Western telcos, so mm-hmm. British Telecom in the UK, mm-hmm. Deutsche Telekom in Germany, mm-hmm. SoftBank in Japan. These mm-hmm. kind of these kind of companies, um, and and you suddenly start realizing you can build these, you know, telco grade networks using this really cheap um, Wi-Fi type technology. You know, and so telco the, grade. Yeah, so telco grade is you know. Um, is going to work twenty four seven. Is going to yes. support millions of customers. Mm-hmm. Is is going to be um, comparable with the types of services you historically would get from four G or three G or or fiber yeah. type networks. Yeah, and so with cheap, with very cheap equipment. Very cheap equipment. Correct. Yeah. Hmm. So, you know, Wi Fi wasn't developed to build these types of networks. Yes. It was built dis- developed for the office, for the home. Correct. Um, but suddenly, the, the the quality of that technology was improving, mm-hmm. and the co- and because of the size of the deployments of Wi-Fi, mm. the millions and hundreds of millions of devices, probably even billions by now, um, the cost of the equipment was co- was getting was cheaper. coming down. It was getting cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. So suddenly, so you realize, Moore's law checked in. I'm sorry. Moore's law checked in. Yeah. Connectivity, yeah. cost of. Uh, you know, equipment continuously going down. Every wi- every phone has a Wi-Fi chip inside of it. Every laptop has a Wi-Fi chip. Every, you know, and quality a- going up. Correct. Yeah. Interesting. Correct. And and the ability to join very large amounts of this equipment mm-hmm. together. Uh-huh. Uh, so because of you know a big telecom network like a cellular network or a fiber network. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a very, very complex thing, and it covers a huge geographical space. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, countrywide type type services, and and so suddenly you had this very cheap um, technology appearing mm-hmm. um, that could be used to, to to replicate what historically would cost a lot of money to build. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, all this is preparing you for poor internet. Correct. So I left Fon mm-hmm. and um, started what eventually became uh, Poa. Yes. Um, and we we realised that because of the, the the low cost nature of this technology, um, you know that you don't have to pass the cost on to the customer mm-hmm. anymore. So that could reduce the cost of serving mm-hmm. serving internet. You know, and this is sort of 2014. Okay. type of time frame and so you kind of look around um africa but also parts of, the, of latin america parts yeah. of asia and realize yeah. there's a very large number of people who aren't getting online um you know and a big portion of that is because of the cost of getting online so let's talk a little bit about that the mm-hmm. statistics about on how many people are connected mm-hmm. today vis-a-vis the total global population would you say we are at about 
globally uh, on average? Globally, probably about that level. Yeah. Yes, about fifty percent. But it's 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 very so weighted that's average on, on average. But yes, that's weighted average, to certain yes. countries. I mean, Absolutely. some countries have ninety, a hundred percent. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot less. You know, you have South Korea with uh, and Finland with some of the highest uh, internet connectivity uh, penetration. To Africa now, where internet connectivity, despite all the progress over the last couple of years, undersea cables, telcos connecting people, Kenya with NOFBI, uh, the fiber optic program that the Kenya government has invested billions of shillings in, on average, we are still at about 34 35 percent in kenya the communications authority says 80 percent but that's taking into account double seeming mm -hmm. so in actual fact we're actually probably much less than that from a planning perspective when you're looking at poor internet and uh, a little bit more about poor internet what 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 number do you plan with in terms of internet penetration rate in our, in in Kenya? Um, I mean, we we would probably agree there's probably th twenty to thirty percent of people online, but but for us, it's not just about getting people online because mm -hmm. it's it's the the level of data that people consume. So uh -huh. many of those people who are online, mm -hmm. you know, their experience is, is through a mobile phone. Correct. It's, um, the using, majority would say almost yeah almost certainly mm -hmm. yeah but the, the the pricing structure that they you know of 3g and 4g mm -hmm. networks mm -hmm. um, you know people are consuming tiny tiny amounts of data so you know a couple of hundred meg two mm -hmm. three four hundred mm -hmm. meg mm -hmm. of data a month which mm -hmm. is about 20 minutes of YouTube you know 30 40 yeah. minutes of YouTube Correct. so so for us it's not just about getting people online it's about getting people online and giving them the ability to really engage with the internet mm -hmm. you know to stream video to yeah. to watch movies mm -hmm. to get their kids educated yeah. online to you know to fully use the internet whereas um, you know, we see that a lot of the a lot of people are getting online, but mm -hmm. they the costs are so prohibitive. Mm -hmm. You know, this cost per megabyte model of mm -hmm. the cellular operators, mm -hmm. um, they simply can't afford to use a lot of internet. So, connectivity is one thing, but you know, you don't want to think of the internet as a scarce resource that you can't afford to use. You know, that, that should be metered out. It should be something that you can fully engage with and get the full benefit out of. So. I think one of the SDGs is about connectivity and getting people online. And the United Nations has actually declared internet access as a human right. So if we take that perspective and we look at, for example, in Kenya now, where you have most of government services online today through e-citizen and then look at the internet penetration right how do you think poor is what role do you think poor can play and where are you at now where do you feel you can go in the next in the next five years and let's talk a little bit more about that cost yeah so the you know the, that internet penetration is is very hard you know it's different for different demographics Correct. across the country you know Correct. if you look at the the rich it'll be almost a hundred percent it'll look very similar to these countries you mentioned yeah. you know korea yeah. Or, yeah. or finland yeah. um but as you head into uh you know the the lower income communities and the more mass market mm -hmm. uh the penetration drops off yeah so it, it, dramatically uh, i'm sorry dramatically dramatically yeah, yeah. very much so you mm -hmm. know and so as you um, you know, head into these places, you know, it gets worse and worse. So it's mm -hmm. not an even 20% across the country. There's mm -hmm. a, um, you know, what's, what gets referred to as the, a digital divide. Mm -hmm. You know, people are on one side of this or the other. And if you're on the right side of that, then you've got access to all these services yeah. and government yeah. facilities yeah. Yeah. and yeah. so on and access to knowledge and information. And if you're on the wrong side of it, um, you know, your, your life is so much harder. Mm. You know, and you're cut off from... Um, you know, in what will inevitably be increasing digitization of society. So what's the cost for your average customer? What's the cost of power? So we um, we offer a residential 
broadband mm -hmm. service. So this is a, a serv an internet service to people's homes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're not offering a, a mobile service. We're not trying to re, re, you know, replace 4G yeah, or 3G. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to offer internet to people in their houses. In their homes. And, and globally, 80% of all internet is in, is in the home because that's home. where you want to stream a movie or watch Correct. the football or, or all of these these kind of things. Go on um, Zoom, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, that obviously with things like COVID, mm -hmm. you know, that's where people were educating their yeah. kids and, yeah. and so yeah. on. Um, so that's where people really want to use a lot of data. Um, and our service is a fixed price service. We charge uh, 1,500 shillings a month uh, for unlimited data. So you, you know, you, we deliver, it feels like a fiber to the home service. We give the customer a Wi-Fi router. Uh, they can connect their phones or their laptops mm -hmm. or their TV or anything to, mm -hmm. this, to this device uh, and then consume as much data as they want uh, for that one fixed price uh, per month. And what's the fixed price? 1,500 shillings. 1,500 shillings. shillings, yeah. Do you think that's an acceptable figure for most of households in Kenya, 1,500? Um, it's certain Is there a possibility that that can come down? And we're, what we're, would... So, uh, yes, we would like to reduce mm -hmm. the price even further. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you compare that to what's available, mm. it's significantly better price. It's significantly better. So, so it's half the price of fibre to the home services, but in many of the places... Of other competitors. Correct. From who, other who may not even cover the areas that you're covering. Correct. And yes. so actually for most of our customers, they can't get fibre to the home. So their mm. only option is, is 3G or 4G yes. if they've got connectivity at all. Um, and if you want to consume a lot of data, those mm. services are incredibly expensive. So mm. our, our customers are consuming over 200 gigabytes of data per month. Wow. If you had to do that on a 3G or a 4G network, you're in many, many thousands, if not tens that of thousands of, of shillings. Of shillings, yeah. Um, so in comparison to both fiber and cellular, we're significantly cheaper now. Um, for sure, 1,500 shillings is, is, a, is a very good price. Um, but we would like it to be better. Yeah, so we're working on ways to bring that get that get that price even lower. Um, and obviously, the more the lower we can get it, the more people can afford to take on the service. And we want to get to the point where the vast majority of homes would be able to afford our service. So, Andy, I mean, look, the fact of the matter is that we still have low penetration rates of internet, caused by a number of reasons that you have sort of uh, articulated cost of internet access we are still not there yet i'd like us to talk a little bit about the anatomy of getting that internet home in as simple a matter a way as possible from the fiber from the undersea cables to the home and where you think your advantage is, I mean, if it's not a business secret, of course, uh, how are you managing those numbers? And how soon can you get these to as many homes as possible? So, so most of the cost of delivering internet is in, in what we call the last mile, uh -huh. which is the, uh, the final step of getting internet to people's to people's homes so yes. so we can deliver um, a gigabyte of data from london to mombasa mm -hmm. uh, for about a shilling a shilling a shilling and it costs about a shilling to get it from mombasa to nairobi so that's two shillings two shillings per gigabyte per gigabyte okay so that's wholesale that's wholesale and by mm. that but that well Yes, but, but it's in, we're in that re yes. realm of territory. But yes. then by the time it gets to the cu customer, mm. um, that suddenly becomes, you know, 100, a 200 shillings, yeah. you know, a massive increase. And so the, from two shillings to about 100 and some cases, 200 shillings. Yes, correct. Uh, and all of that cost comes from this this piece called the last mile so mm -hmm. that is either the the cellular network the 3g the mm -hmm. 4g network mm -hmm. it's the the fiber mm -hmm. network it's mm -hmm. the, the final step of getting it from this wholesale supply these these international fiber cables yes, yes. to the customer mm. um, and that's where nearly all the cost is and so what we at power focus on is how do we 
build that last mile as cost effectively mm. as possible. Mm. Um, and there is a little bit of business secret in how we do that, but, okay. but principally the logic is very straightforward. Mm -hmm. We, the less we have to spend on building that network, the, the the less you'll pass on that cost correct. to the customer. Correct. That's it. It's very straightforward, and the less it costs to operate. So it's not just building it; it's building it mm -hmm. and operating it. But the more efficiently we can do that. The, the lower the price we can offer. So we're talking about operating costs. Operating cost and yes. capital cost, yeah. Okay. I had a very interesting conversation today morning uh, with Harry and some friends. And these guys were saying that um, it's interesting how home internet is sold. And that there's a study that was done that the best salespeople are the security guard, <laughs> And the caretaker. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I mean, because uh, you're on the ground. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Of course. I mean, we. You know, whenever we or any internet home internet mm. provider mm. delivers, mm. Um, you know, we're putting equipment into into a, in some into somebody's house. Correct. Right. And if particularly if that's a um, an apartment block. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you normally have the Ascari and, yes. and various other people yes. around that that whole process, Correct. and and um, you want them on side. Yes. Yeah. You know, you want them. Um, you, you want, in fact, they're they're part the tip of a, of a whole bunch of people you want yes. on side. You know, mm. I mean, because when we go into these the, the places where we operate, yeah, we're building relationships with the communities 100%. as well, and. There's a whole bunch of sort of power brokers and movers and shakers, and yeah. at the micro level, that turns into the the Ascari and yes, the the, yes. you know, the, the the people at the particular building. Um, but the more they can understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and why that's good for individuals, but also good for these kind of communities. I mean, if we can get more people online in 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 the places we operate, that's just going to be great for the community. Nice. So we spend a lot of time al aligning interests. Um, with these people mm. and helping them understand, you know, how, why why they should help us, not um, not hinder us. Okay, okay. To my viewers who are in Nairobi and Kenya and Eastern Africa, what are your rollout plans? Where are you at now? Mm -hmm. Which areas are you covering? And what's what's your rollout plan in the next couple of years? So at the moment we cover areas in and around. Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So we're in Nairobi, parts of Kiambu, uh, parts of Kajiado, mm -hmm. um, but principally Nairobi and maybe 20 miles in, in, in direction. So you cover the whole of Nairobi? No, we, we focus on building specifically to those areas which are uh, underserved. underserved by by the other operators. Um, so we're, we're generally avoiding where the existing fiber to the mm -hmm. home providers are. There's, mm -hmm. you know, if you live in the right part of town, you've got many connectivity options. Sure, sure. Um, if you live in the wrong part of town, you've got a, a, you know, got a real scarcity, mm -hmm. exactly. So we focus on building into those areas. So we're not uh, city-wide, we're, mm -hmm. we're um, a patchwork, you know, if somebody, you know, there's too many to mention now, there must be 40, 50 communities around Nairobi. Correct. Uh, if you look at our website, there's a long list of, of, of the places we provide. Um, but our, our goal over the next couple of years is to get from Nairobi into as many towns and cities across Kenya mm -hmm. as we can. Mm -hmm. So obviously we want to go to the, the bigger places, the, the Mombasas and, and so on, but also uh, look Kisumu, at the Nakuru. Kisumu, Nakuru, Eldoret, these, mm. these kind of places as well. So we hope to be able to offer service in, in many of the cities across Kenya over the next couple of years. So you recently raised, what, $28 million? Yes. Twenty-eight million dollars. How has that journey been? The fundraising, the time it takes to raise funds. Yet you still have to run a business. Mm. Uh, would you do it again? Are you still looking to fundraise? And what what will be the tips you give to young entrepreneurs starting out? So it's it's never a quick process. Um, of course, everyone hears the press and you see these numbers flashing around and there's some very <laughs> big financing numbers flashing yes. around now. Um, those conversations take many, many months, if not years, to come to fruition. And, and businesses don't get to raise that kind of money or rarely get to raise that money overnight. You know, We started in 2014. It's taken a long time to get to the point where we could 
raise these this sort of capital. Mm. So it's it's not as um, instantaneous as, as it maybe as people maybe make it look. Um, you know, and it's it's a long process. People want to really understand your business. They want to understand are you a good bet? Are, you know, are, how are you going to use the money? Why why are you a good investment? Um, so you know, the, these these conversations are are substantive. You know, people don't wake up in the morning and just write large checks uh, because they feel like it. Um, so <laughs> it's yeah, that's because it's so it's it's hard work. Yeah. Um, in, in our case, fortunately, we have a, you know, a very, very good team. Um, so I get to spend my time raising some of this money, but uh, our team really runs the business and is focused on growing it and signing up customers and doing a great job of providing service. So I've been able to rely on them to continue to, to grow and run the business whilst I've been uh, trying to raise trying to raise this money. Um, in terms of tips for people to raise mm. money, um, I'd, I'd answer that in a few ways. I mean, yeah. the, there's depending on your type of business, mm. different types of financing are are more or less appropriate. So there's, there's a lot made about sort of venture capital type financing Correct. and sort of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. type financing. Um, you know, that money exists, but not many businesses raise it. Mm. Yeah, and um, venture capitalists are looking for very specific types of business mm. um, you know they're looking for businesses that can be absolutely huge they're looking for businesses that scale that scale massively yeah um, you know and if you've got a potentially a very good business but it doesn't meet their characteristics it, you know you're wasting your time knocking on a lot of venture capitalists mm. doors mm. there are mm. other forms of finance for for other types of types of business that's good advice um, and you know I was talking to a guy who runs a, a brilliant shoe business mm. yeah but it's probably not venture capital. No, VCs will not put in money backable yeah. on that. Um, you know, unless unless his shoes have uh, rocket uh, motors in them or yes, something. Unless, you know? unless he can spin it into shoe tech or something, or something. like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, shoes with inbuilt SIM cards yes, that allow yes, you to do yes. fintech mm, transactions mm. or something. But um, but it's a great business. Yeah. So you know, if he wants to raise additional capital, to, you know, there's other places he could yeah. be looking at to yeah. raise to raise money for that business. Um, so you've got to have the right business. You've got to know how to tell the story to, to venture capital. Storytelling. There goes that story, uh, that conversation again. Yeah. It seems like it's a very important component of fundraising. Uh, it is. I mean, you mm. have to be able to explain mm. your business. You have to be able to explain... You know what's good and bad about your business. You have to be able to join the the dots between what a an investor is looking for and what your business does. So you need to go into that have you know into that conversation prepared. You need to be able to sell your business, explain what you do and why you do it, um, and um, you know be able to address the concerns that that investors are going to have. They're going to ask all the hard questions. So you need to have thought through those questions and be ready to answer them. You know, why is this this way? Why does that not happen like this? What what are the risks? You know, you need to have thought through all of these aspects when you when you have those those conversations because the other people you're competing at for with money, you know, for wanting to get the money yes. will have thought through those things. Absolutely. So if you're not ready, then you know you, you know be prepared. Is is definitely uh, how many customers do you currently have? We have about uh, twelve thousand homes. Connected. Twelve thousand homes. Okay. We we also offer Wi-Fi hotspots, and we okay. have about uh, sixty thousand uh, customers for these oh. Wi-Fi hotspots. Okay. Um, and our hope is and that's that, mostly on mobile phone. Um, correct. Yeah. Okay. So the, these are we we have have a service called Power Home, which is our our home yes, service, yes. and a service called Power Street, and that's our Wi-Fi nice. Wi-Fi hotspots, nice. um, and that provides a. Uh, more bite-sized way of getting online so okay, you know okay. that we give anyone who registers for those hotspots 100 mm. megabytes of data per okay. day free okay and free free okay. and then if you want but to buy more you can pay 20 uh, shillings for a shillings. gigabyte of data yeah so very aggressively and competitively uh, priced, priced. Um, and what we find is people use that as a way to get to know us and feel yes. comfortable with us and build trust with us and then and then, and then they move to the to the home service okay, correct interesting so um what's the size of your organization right now in terms of human resource how many people we've got about 110 people 110 people mostly kenyans oh yes yeah. okay 
How and, long and, and many of them from the areas where we operate as well. That so it's fantastic. very important to us that it, that we're, um, you know, these are the guys and girls who know how to navigate the areas where the we areas, where we yes, function. Yes. So um, many of our team, you know, come from from the communities where we operate. So local, local. You are doing lots, lots of the guys who operate, say in Kibera, yeah, actually from Kibera. Correct. Yeah. Great. So, Andy, I'm going to move into uh, a little bit of a touchy subject. Okay. And I'm going to give you the opportunity not to respond, uh, but it will it will be remiss for me not to mention it because this is something that everybody is talking about, and ev a lot of people know my opinion about that, about this particular question. And this question is about uh, why is it that more, f you know, foreign-owned startups actually being funded than local-owned startups? I have very clear thoughts about that and I've not, I have made them very public. So before I, before I allow you to comment or not to comment, you're free not to comment on this. My sense is we need to look at our ecosystem and on in Kenya and across Africa on how we fund um, startups across, across the continent. And I can see that this issue is already being addressed. Uh, market force has just raised 36, uh, I think 34 million uh, dollars. Dash in uh, in um, Ghana has just raised another 32.8. Um, what are your thoughts in on this on this conversation? Well, I will definitely choose to respond to it. Um, no, it's an, I mean it's a very important topic, mm -hmm. right? And. Um, I, ironically, I've seen this situation before. I mean, that's mm -hmm. one of the benefits of being slightly older. Uh, <laughs> yes. you, you see history, you see history repeating Absolutely. itself. Exactly. So, um, you know, venture capital and the type of financing you're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, fundamentally is a kind of Silicon Valley born Correct. thing. Yeah. Correct. And, um, you know, obviously started in Silicon Valley in the sort mm -hmm. of 70s and 80s. Yes. Um, but when the uh, the internet was first starting to happen and there was this thing called the dot-com boom, which mm -hmm. was kind of through the late 90s and yes. maybe up to sort of 2000, early yes. 2000s, um, venture capital and venture capital-backed companies suddenly started appearing in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this, I was, I was a youngster uh, starting businesses mm -hmm. at, that, at that sort of time. Mm -hmm. Um, and and what you found was that the the money appeared to be both coming from and going to U.S. founders. Yeah, so we were all uh -huh. sitting there in London and Europe. Interesting. Um, but you had these American guys turning up in Europe, starting dot com businesses as they in were. Europe. In Europe, funded by American funded by money. Americans. You know, so the VC firms that were appearing were all uh, the European kind of offshoots of uh, of U.S. VCs. So you had U.S. money. I didn't money. know that. Uh, yeah, and 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 there was a big debate going on at the time, which is why is there not European money going into European startups, which mirrors the conversation that's that's going on today. Correct. Uh, In Africa. Um, yeah. Correct. Absolutely. And what happened was, you know, why was that happening? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the the source of the money came from America. Yeah. There was. Um, fundamentally a group of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who knew how to speak to VCs. To VCs. Yeah, because they'd yeah. been part of that ecosystem in the Correct. US and then Correct. they moved to uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. And basically you had kind of US money talking to US kind of founders. founders. Yeah, and they knew how to have that conversation. Um, but what started to then happen was the ecosystem in, in Europe mm. started to develop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the people who were working in those startups, in those early startups, mm -hmm. started who were Europeans, the, who were Europeans mm. started their own businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And many of the people who were hired into the venture capital community mm -hmm. were Europeans. Or Europeans. And then they started raising their own funds. Nice. And suddenly there were some success stories. And European investors started putting money into venture capital. Um, and suddenly you've got this new ecosystem brewing of kind of European-backed mm -hmm. investors backing mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And the same is going to happen in Africa. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're 
bit by bit seeing more and more African entrepreneurs True. starting businesses. We're seeing Africans in the venture for you know some of the early venture funds obviously True. had were quite foreigner led, yes. but you're seeing uh, African. Uh, VCs. I think a lot of that has already started happening in a bigger scale in Nigeria, and and that's possibly driven by the underlying capital. Yeah, so that there's, yes. um, you know, those VCs that are starting mm -hmm. there, um, possibly are getting more local capital. Yeah, I um, love that uh, perspective and that nuance. Let me just, in another episode, we were talking with um, Robert. Ochiang and uh, Peter Jiangwe. Peter is ex uh, NASPAS. And we were giving a scenario around how the local VC market, especially in Kenya, can be developed. And Peter said something that was very fundamental. He said, by the way, the government has a law that allows private equity um, pension funds to invest up to, I think, 5% into VC, private equity sort of businesses. Mm. But for some reason, that hasn't happened. So as we complain, we need to look inwards. <laughs> so the figure that was bandied around was 70 billion that can be available mm. for local uh, entrepreneurs. And that's an interesting nuance I didn't know about the way Europe also evolved and the same history seems to be repeating itself, mm. which sort of brings me to that. Um, I remember, I can't remember the German philosopher who said this, but he said, we learn from history that we never learn from history. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, indeed. I mean, and the same situation happened with, you know, capital particularly pension fund capital, this is messing with people's, you know, kind of life savings, Correct. so to speak, right? Correct. So it's got to be um, appropriate mm -hmm. in how it develops its, mm -hmm. its money. And, and mm -hmm. um, we saw the same in Europe. I mean, mm -hmm. It was very conservative, but over time, successful businesses, you know, were grown, yes. venture capital invested mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the investors in those businesses made mm -hmm. good return. Yes. And slowly, the pension funds started allocating money into to venture capital, in, in, into uh, the tech, into the tech sector. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, because it became a proven sector. It was a place to put their money. Now, mm -hmm. most of their money, of course, should be going into public stocks and bonds and these kind of very, these you know, these lower risk activities. Yeah, yeah, but a percentage yeah. eventually should go into it, into the high um, risk sector. But once the but we need those companies to be, we need this, some, some success stories in East Africa. Sure. We need businesses exiting, not just mm. raising money. It's, you know, investors make their money when a business exits. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we need that to happen. And as that happens, then it becomes, you know, the, the market for this becomes more and more proven. And, you know, the capital flows, but also the, the knowledge and the skill set flows. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you... If you look at the kind of the U.S. starting point for venture capital, you had a few small companies, sure. people like Intel, mm -hmm. Hewlett Packard, mm -hmm. you know, and the people who were working at those companies mm -hmm. founded the the Apples and yes. the Ataris, yes. that next generation, the and, Microsoft. Then the, and the people from those companies then founded the, uh, you know, the Googles the Google, and, the the, and the Amazons and these mm. these kind of companies, and the same needs to happen here. Yeah, so I like that. You know, my 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 like severe that. hope is that these companies that are you know like ourselves and some of the others, mm -hmm. um, the people who are working in our companies, they they will leave and they will build their own businesses. I like that yeah. thinking. I really um, and like so, that. And so thinking. we're we're at this we're kind of not quite at day zero, but not far beyond this mm -hmm. of this new kind of ecosystem mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. here in 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 East Africa, but also Africa in general. I mean, there's obviously the the whole Nigerian sector yes. as well going on. Um, and you know the people who are working in our company, some of them will create their own business, and we've already seen it. We've seen some of our people leaving mm. and getting involved in other startups in, nice. or starting new businesses, and and I'm all for that. I mean, it's it's restrictive of us to say, 
you know, our employees should stay with us forever. Mm. Yeah, that's that's not good for them and it's not good for the business because actually when people leave, it creates opportunities for our existing employees to step into new roles and so on. So we're part of something bigger. Correct. Um, all the other tech companies, in, in, in certainly in East Africa mm-hmm. and probably across Africa, mm-hmm. are part of something bigger. Yeah. And the movement of both capital and people amongst all these companies, um, you know, and smart guys inside of mm. our company starting new things mm. that's great if we're good we'll work out how to get the most out of those correct, people as well um, but you know we want people eventually to move on you know if we um, you know if I if I kind of sort of sat there and sort of looked at Poe in hopefully 20 years time you know when I'm a, an old man sitting on my on my, <laughs> on my porch um, you know if I can look back and see two things will have been successful the first is if you know people have in the same way my experience was kind of using uh, that first computer in school mm, started mm, me mm. on a journey. Yeah. You know, if I hear somebody, you know, talking to, you know, your your grandson or whatever yes. about how yes. they started, you know, they remember their first mm. experience of the mm-hmm. internet was using power and that got yes. them really excited about something we probably don't even know about yet, you know, <laughs> some crazy AI biological yes, mix or something. Yes. And they started their business and they think fondly about the time of how they got online with POA. That would be a win. Yeah, that would be an excellent win. Be a win. And if we can see a whole bunch of interesting companies that have grown from the people who are in and around POA, because we obviously have employees, but there's a whole ecosystem Correct. of companies that work with us. If those guys go on and build that next generation of companies, mm-hmm. And the whole sort of ecosystem expands from there, and we can sort of say we were one of the first ones mm-hmm. to start that mm-hmm. ball rolling. Then that's been a you know that that would be a success. That's the win. Andy, we are coming to a close, so I want to ask you one last question: What keeps you awake every night? <laughs> um, the challenge for us now is going to be how you know we've got. We've got a business model that works. We've got a business that works. We've raised, you know, money into this business. Uh, we've now got to build it big. You know, I w- how do we get this to hundreds of thousands of How do homes? you scale? How do we scale? How do we, you know, our, it's great we've got 12,000 homes connected, but, you know, in, that's a drop in the ocean. You want a million. Or, or, or many more. millions. Many millions, yeah. Uh, not just from, you know, from a commercial perspective, but if, you know, our mission as a business is how do we get, you know, people across that digital divide. Mm-hmm. And if we can't do that for millions and millions and millions, then we're not really moving the dial mm. on this thing. So how do we build this as big as we can? How do we get to as many people as we can? How do we, you know, create as much impact as, as possible with this? So those are the um, the things that kind of keep me, you know, awake, awake, noodling on these problems. Yeah. Great. So from Kenya, where next? Um, we're looking at where do we take this. I mean, the, the problem we're solving is a is a problem in Kenya, but it's mm-hmm. a you know it's a constant wide problem. It is a yeah. continent wide problem. Um, and so we're we're spending time now thinking about how are we going to copy this model into as many places as we can as quickly as we can, um, and working through which countries do we do we go to. Okay. Um, so we, we haven't got that nailed quite yet. Nailed down. It's, um, it's still a work in progress. Still very much a work in progress, but the intent is very much there. Andy, thank you so much. I really okay. want to thank you for, for the time today and delving into uh, who you are uh, and how you got into into Kenya, poor internet. I'm hoping that uh, your application to become a citizen is sitting at immigration and uh, I hope you know that we, we have dual citizenship now we with do. the new constitution. Yep. Uh, you know, I always say that uh, Kenya has become a global hub. Okay. So if it becomes a global hub, then we need global citizens. So I would like to tell you, Karibu Sana, continue uh, building your, uh, you know, your internet empire in Kenya and across the continent. Thank you very much. Viewers, we come to the end of this conversation with Andy. I really want to thank you again for uh, giving us your 45 minutes uh, to listen to us. Please keep it here, keep keep it real and kindly make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. You follow us on all the major podcasts. Thank you very much. (music) 